And we welcome all the guests who are attending as well as those who are joining us on Zoom. Um, the meeting will be recorded and available at the City Seaside's uh, website at a later date. Um, we will be allowing for public comment. And if you haven't already, please sign up on one of these forms, which is just outside the door, and hand them to me in the next few minutes. Um, it, a reminder to all of our guests here today that this is an official meeting of the library board, and we please ask that you be mindful of Robert's rules and order guidelines. As guests of this meeting, speaking outside of public comment period is not permitted, and we thank you for your attention to this matter. I'm going to take a roll call first of the board. Kathleen People. Present. Eve Marks. Present. Megan Hughes. Present. Myself, Tess Ratty. Present. And Cheryl Adamchek is absent. We have uh, City Council Liaison, Tita Montero. Present. And Library Director, Jennifer Reddy. Present. Thank you. I'm going to call for an approval of the agenda by the board with one change. And the agenda. Uh, we're going to move the public comment after opening remarks. So if you would approve the agenda with that change. I approve. Okay, thank you. The agenda has been approved. <coughs> The opening remarks are that this is a special meeting of the library board to review two requests for reconsideration. We will review each title separately following the same process. The library director will first present the library policy as an overview. Emily O'Neill, chair of the Intellectual Freedom Committee for the Oregon Library Association, is joining us via Zoom and will give a brief overview of the First Amendment and how it applies to public libraries. We will then introduce the first item under reconsideration. So now the public comment portion of the agenda, which has been moved, will begin. And um, I will call your name. <clears throat> Please come up to the podium over here. State your name and where you live. You don't need to give your address, just the city. You will have two minutes for your public comment. And a reminder of the rules of public comment are no comment shall contain profane, obscene, abusive, threatening, or slanderous content. The public may not direct questions to the library board or staff during the public comment period. And for the sake of time, if there's any of you have the same thing to say that everybody else is saying, you might condense it in your group or have just one person speak for your group. I'll call you in the order that I received them. Okay, first we have, oh yeah, after two minutes, Jennifer's bowed down. <laughs> so we don't have to say, hey. <laughs> um, Sarah Mullery. Thank you. I'm Sarah. This is my son, Copeland. <laughs> um, I live in Seaside. I'm a Seaside resident. And a few weeks ago, I checked out and Tango makes the first time. Uh, whatever it is. Uh, is that okay? Is that me or is it just Ethan? Somebody needs to be me. I'm dreaming of a Walter White Christmas. I've reset it. You true Zoom call if we just have this out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
Okay. Um, so when I returned the book, I mentioned to Anna, a librarian, how much I loved it, which is something I have never done before, never brought it to someone's attention. I have this three-year-old here, and we are regular library users. Um, over the past few years, I have checked out hundreds of children's books, and I have never brought one to a librarian's attention before this book. It stood out to me not only because it was a lovely, true story, but also because it gave me an opportunity to speak to my son about families that don't look just like others. Um, this library, which I feel like is my library, um, is an institution that is meant to serve everybody. There are transgender people and gay people in our community, and they deserve to have themselves represented. I, as a mother, also deserve to choose what I expose my child to. It is not only my right, but it is my job, and it is no one else's job to choose that for me. One group or individual should not decide what everyone else gets to read. I want my child to know, understand, and respect people who are different from us, and I'm asking that you please keep these books in the collection for my family and all of Thank you. Next is Jerry Guamara. Am I pronouncing that right? Close. Oh. <laughs> um, my name is Jerry Kawamura. I'm a resident of Seaside as well. And thank you. Um, first of all, I think thank you for your comments. I thought it was very well stated. Uh, it said a lot of things that I'm sure a lot of people think. Um, at a higher level, I think at one level up from the actual library, I think it's uh, basically summarizing. You have to keep politics and these types of politics out of the library, out of the bedroom, out of the bathroom, and out of the library. That they don't belong here. These types of decisions should be left to parents and to the people that read the books, not to the politicians. Thank you. Cooper Boggs. Uh, Cooper Boggs, I'm a resident technically of Warrington. I live in the country, so they call it Warrington. Book banning is the most widespread form of censorship in the United States. Censorship happens when some people impose their personal political or moral values on somebody else. Censorship is saying, don't let anyone read this book because I object. Censorship is a violation of the First Amendment rights of freedom of the press and freedom of expression. Censorship by the government is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. A public library is a government entity. This has been supported by numerous lawsuits in front of the Supreme Court and lower courts. Public libraries are run by the government, so they are a government entity, and the government cannot impose censorship. It is unconstitutional for the government to censor what each one of us can read, watch, or listen to. Restricting access to certain books is the same as removing those books. People under 18, minors, have First Amendment rights. Restricting access to books is violating their First Amendment rights. That is also supported by other cases. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick announcement. Um, there is a blue Toyota with a handicap sign um, that is parked in the loading zone at Sunset Empire. So, oh, just a heads up that it crosses the street. Yes. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Any auditory issues all the way in the band, so if we could speak up just a little bit, please and thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. Move up. Rugs me. The board, the public. My name is Russ Mee. I'm a law professor. I'm also a citizen of Seaside. On the most fundamental level, banning books is wrong. It is my right, it is a fundamental right. It's not a minor right. It's a fundamental right for me to read anything that I choose. It's a library's responsibility to provide books to the community that the community has interest in. Everyone in this room has a fundamental right. When the city, through the library, starts telling us what we can read, and what we can't read, it's the city taking away a fundamental right that is guaranteed to us by being a citizen of the United States. This is a wrong practice. We should all stand up. We should stand up for this fundamental right and all of our fundamental rights. It is a very slippery slope when we start to allow people to tell us what we can read, what we can't read, to start banning all types of other freedoms that we hold dear. Thank you. Pam was here. I just I just concur with what everyone's saying. I think there's more yeah. than what the plan of people here. And I support you. what people are saying. <laughs> Tom Schrenner. Hello, my name is Tom Schwinzer. I don't break the I get the distinct feeling that the people in this room are here in, in favor of fighting banning books. And I'm really glad for the people that are here for them. And what I really wanted to say was all of us and those we might come into contact with who perhaps have a different view that needs to be changed, because that does need to be changed if it's different, is that we cannot look at this as if this is where it begins, because it truly isn't where it begins. This is where it grows. And that's how it has to stop. This is all across the nation. This uh, one book here, I, I read it. It uh, more of like a penguin. That's been challenged since 2005, I believe, in, in many communities. So it's not beginning here. We have to continue that fight and remember at all times that the banning of books and free speech and all the other things that are recorded to us and protected by the First Amendment have to be adhered to and protected because otherwise, the dark forces that are in force across the nation now to remove our rights need to see that we know they're trying to grow these insidious notions they have and that we won't allow them. That's my comment. Yeah. <laughs> Jesse Reed. Hello, um, I'm Jesse Reed from Seaside. Um, just want to put some facts out there for everyone. Seaside currently has about 1,490 students in its schools, following national statistics of 7.1%. That means roughly 106 of our students are LGBTQ2SIA+. Following further statistics, of 2%, that means at least 29 of them are transgender. Age appropriate and diverse representation in books significantly impacts our children, how they see themselves and their ability to empathize with people who are different from them. I am proud of the large diversity of books offered by our library here. And I have full faith in a library board and our community to be supportive and inclusive of everybody. Donna Benefil. 
Hello, I'm Donna and I live here in Seaside. It fills my heart with hope and joy to see so many of our community here. I have full confidence in our library staff and library board to make a fair assessment of the books that have been challenged. Seaside is a diverse community and our literature should serve everyone, not just what the white Christian pat patriarchy wants on our shelves. Thank you. Thank you. Tessa Jane Sellers. <laughs> this is so fun. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I am Tessa James Scheller. I live uh, on Plants of Plains, but I started in the seaside on Beach Drive back in 1979. I was hired as the nurse anesthetist for then Seaside General Hospital. And um, I was the sole anesthetist in town for six, seven years. So. Do the math, I may have been there for some of your births, <laughs> uh, or some conscious birth. But um, my family loves Oregon, we love this place, and you are reasons why. Thank you, Library Board, Madam Chair, all of you, staff, citizens, representatives. What a great town, what a great place. Um, and what this is also fundamentally about is, yeah, people are queer, people are transgender, yeah. I was born in 1951. You could not find a man for those things. I looked it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. What did it say? Something like bestiality. If you want to do this awful thing. So this is an effort to make people like me disappear, or my children, or your children disappear, or your father, your mother, your sister, your brother. We all we all know somebody who's queer. We really do. It's not a scary thing anymore. But that's what they're banking on. You're afraid to ban your books. Oh, no, they won't. Thank you, Seaside. Thank you, Library Board. <laughs> Andrew Adams. Uh, I get the feeling that the board might already be convinced. I really hope so. For some reason, not. Uh, so, okay. A little shout out. Thank you. I commend. Everyone uh, here in town that's uh, trying to support uh, and look out for the, the, the little folks, little, physically little folks, <laughs> children, you know, vulnerable folks are children, right? Uh, again, if you're not convinced yet, just maybe you can just think back when you were little like that. Kids can be so cool, right? So this isn't just about... Um, a book that can help a kid who's identifying with like, oh, I, I can't identify with these characters. It's to help the other kids understand folks that are queer. It may be less cool. Okay, thank you. Pat Layman. Thank you. Um, I concur with everything that's been said so far, and I just want to add that I am very proud to be part of this community. And Bradford. Hi, I am Ann Branson. Uh, I'm a resident of Seaside. I'm a bookseller at Beach Books, and I am a former library staff member. Um, I'm actually going to read something that our store on repair in Everling wrote. Uh, she unfortunately can't be here today, but the thing she said, uh, we all on staff really resonated with. I like to think of books as both mirrors and windows. When I was young, I saw myself in the books I read. The girl I was, the girl I wanted to be. Fortunately today, more kids can see themselves in books, whether they are children of color, from single parent homes, with same sex parents, or with other different experiences. Through books, they can see they are not alone. But books are also windows. Through books, we can walk in other shoes. Kids can learn about other cultures, other struggles. They can see that despite outward differences, they, we are all very much the same. Families are families. Friends are friends. Love is love. Book fans seek to fog these mirrors and close these windows. They seek to impose one point of view on that the whole, that the whole community can read. I have complete faith in our librarians and the parents themselves who know their collection well. They put the right age-appropriate books in the hands, in the right hands. They deserve our trust and respect. Thank you. Thank you. 
like the butler? Nope. Yes. I agree with everything that Anne Brantley said. <laughs> <laughs> Roseanne Perry. Hi, I'm Roseanne Perry. I um I have been a teacher. I am a bookseller at Any Foods Books in Portland, and I am the author of picture books and middle grade novels for children. I um I have often thought First Amendment is the first thing we decided to say about ourselves as a nation. The very first thing we said. It's the First Amendment, and I'm so grateful to see it presented robustly here. I am grateful for libraries across the country who maintain you have a beautiful children's room here. They just saw the endless. <laughs> it's gorgeous. And librarians have stood up against book banning for decades upon decades. And I am grateful for it. My publishers. Our random house and Harper Collins, those are large, large, large companies that mostly think about the bottom line. But it is possible for them to publish books like When They Became a Brother and The Fame Makes Three because libraries are there saying yes to books. Right? In a way that there's not enough buying public, right, for those books. But because the library is there steadfastly saying yes to those books, and defending them, the more challenging that makes the creation of those books possible. And I am grateful this library and the American Library Association and also the American Booksellers for Intellectual Freedom who have fought this quite long and hard as well. <clears throat> and so, um, if you have this community, are not alone in this struggle. You have support waiting for you at the Department of Education and the Office of Civil Rights, right? There are there are lots of support in your nation for what you're feeling here in the strong. So thank you. We have a few more. Ted Cooper. My name is Ted Cooper. I live in the South End of Seaside and I believe banning books is wrong. It's a slippery slope. Uh, who's going to be judge and jury for which books stay and which don't? And also, even if you're a person who wants to ban this book, well, how are you going to teach your kid? It's your responsibility as a parent. How are you going to teach your kid? I don't like this. You don't have an example of what you don't like. Do you have that book in the library? This is what I feel like about this book, and you can get it off at the beginning if you don't like it. I mean, you just you just defeated your own purpose by paying the book. <laughs> <laughs> you just... I am very proud of this community and everybody that spoke up. I cannot add anything more. You're a wonderful group. Thank you so much for showing up. Taking your time for a subject like this is just amazing. And I'm so proud of all of you. And last but not least, Kate Skay. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Kate Skye. I'm a resident of Seaside. Um, this is going on my fourth winter here. Um, I just want to say I'm um, very much in support of these folks meeting. I am in an interesting relationship with my own queerness, and I so wish I had these books. I'll say that I've been, I've been welcomed by the communities here and I'm so appreciative. And also, I'm not sure what to divulge to my neighbors and to my community because of um, fear and my family. And also, I have so many undeserved privileges and safety because of how I present in the world. So I want to do that. And um, I didn't have this representation of what family could look like. So I've come to my career later in life. 
And even if I wasn't ready for it as a young kid, seeing books like this could have painted a scene. And if my parents could have seen that and um, supported it, you know, me and my family just uh, having exposure to many different things that could um, look like family and connection and community and the world is so much bigger than the nucleus family. And I believe that libraries are a place to have access to these different types of resources and ideas because who knows what seeds those plants can grow in this um, so That concludes the public comment section, and we thank you all for your comments. We'll now move on to, uh, let's see, we moved that, so now we're going to review of the library policies. Jennifer? Exciting stuff. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not going to read our entire collection development policy that is available for everyone to peruse on our website. Uh, I do want to just read um, our library mission to get us started, that the board is familiar with, with our policies as they are pretty much the ones who helped uh, construct them before we presented them to city council. Uh, so the library's mission is the freedom to know is the foundation of democracy. The Seaside Public Library dedicates itself to collecting and distributing an array of information and ideas that is diverse in material, varied in formats, and rich in viewpoint. Uh, reflecting the multicultural character of the community and world it serves. The Seaside Library offers equal access to its resources and encouragement in their use so that enlightenment, literacy, and lifelong learning may flourish. Uh, and just a reminder that the library board members um, have been appointed by the mayor uh, and are asked to uphold the mission and policies of the library, which have been approved by the city council. So our collection de development policy has a bunch of different criteria in it. Um, I'll, I'll pick out a few of the highlights here. Uh, again, it's, it's founded on the principles of intellectual freedom, and we're going to um, hear a little bit more about uh, First Amendment and libraries from um, Emily O'Neill after this. And uh, again, e equal access for all and the preservation of the documentary record of culture. And we also, um, as the library, we, we build and maintain collections for the general public while recognizing the needs of special population groups. Again, I won't read it all. It is available on our website. Um, there is a process for reconsideration. So if, if um, the, the way we see it is everyone has the right to, to make these choices for themselves. And if, uh, if an individual feels that a particular um, book or movie or audio doesn't belong in, in our library. Generally, what happens is we start with a conversation. Um, hopefully, they will come to me or one of those staff members and say, hey, I, this, this book really offended me. Uh, and it starts with a conversation. Um, and then I explain, again, that, that mission, what we're here for, um, and, and our collection development policy. That, and that, that's what guides our process of adding books to the collection. If at the end of that conversation, the individual feels um, that they are still feel strongly about having an item removed, we do have a request for reconsideration form available for folks to fill out. That is something that usually just lives behind the desk or with me. Um, and um, so an individual has that opportunity to submit uh, their, their request for reconsideration. And according to our policies, that request comes to the board for review, and then they vote, and then it, they give me the recommendation. And, and ultimately, the content of the library um, falls to me as the library director. So that's what we're here doing today, is reviewing um, those requests for reconsideration. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief overview, a reminder of those policies. Um, and I think at this time, what we'll do is um, turn it over to Emily O'Neill, who can speak much more knowledgeably on um, the Intellectual Freedom Committee. She's the chair of the Intellectual Freedom Committee for the Oregon Library Association. Uh, and she has a short presentation about the First Amendment and public libraries that she will be sharing with us today. Thank you for being here, Emily. Thanks for having me. Um, let me start my screen share. Um, I do want to start and just say that, you know, 
oftentimes when I'm asked to do trainings or presentations, I don't know how, what level of understanding the audience I am speaking to has. And I'm really encouraged to hear all of the public comments from all of you. So um, hopefully this is a bit of an overview. And if not, it just creates some foundation to the decisions that the board has in front of them today. Um, so the first thing I just wanna share is what is the office or, or the uh, Intellectual Freedom Committee? So the Intellectual Freedom Committee is part of the Oregon Library Association, and it is a standing committee that is empowered by that OLA board to educate, support, um, and support the value of intellectual freedom around uh, the state of Oregon. So as libraries experience um, potential violations of intellectual freedom and First Amendment rights in Oregon libraries, uh, there is a committee available to help guide and support those libraries, which is why I am here today. So the thing I want to start with is, why does this matter? And I know so many of you already touched on your personal stories and you are well aware of why this matters. Um, but it ultimately comes down to, if you reverse engineer the words intellectual freedom, it is the freedom of your own intellect. So the freedom to think, the freedom to learn, the freedom to choose what information you ingest. Um, and really, ultimately, it comes down to your First Amendment rights, which is the point now where I have to say, um, this is not legal advice. So if you were to talk about the law, um, you need to tell people whether or not you're a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. I am a librarian, um, and so if you need direct legal advice, I recommend you contact a practicing attorney. But I do know a lot about the First Amendment, um, having worked professionally in this field for a long time. So this is my um, understanding of our tie to the First Amendment through your public libraries. So to talk about the First Amendment, you really need to go all the way back. So this is a little bit of a politics um, uh, session, a, a little bit of a reminder of our US history and how the constitution was uh, created. So back when the constitution was originally um, written into law, into our country law, that it required a section called the Bill of Rights. And specifically, the colonies would not sign the Constitution without that set of Bill of Rights. They became very passionate about that Bill of Rights. And the reason for that is that, you know, they came from a country where their rights and their humanness was not being honored and protected. And so it's specifically called the Bill of Rights because they're your basic civil liberties. Um, they're the liberties that are given to you in your humanness in this country. So what it means to be a human being in the United States is to be protected and it is protected under the Bill of Rights under the United States Constitution. When our founding fathers created that Bill of Rights, they were very um, specific to what the words that they used in the placement of those rights. So under the Bill of Rights, there is the First Amendment, which is the one we're talking about today. And that First Amendment includes a wide swath of rights that are included there. So I knew, I heard somebody mention earlier today, it is your freedom of press. It is your freedom of expression. It's your freedom of speech. Um, and the reason why there are so many elements to that First Amendment right is because they're the most important. So the Founding Fathers specifically chose those rights to be under the First Amendment, knowing they were the most important ones to protect as a, a living human being in the United States. So as time has gone by, um, just like with all of our constitutional rights, we have had our laws um, challenged at it during a court of law. And as you go through these court cases, those definitions become more and more clear. So as a uh, court proceeding happens, then as decisions are made, it creates what's called precedent. 
And that precedent helps fully define what that right means, what that law means. And through the many, many years of uh, court cases and court law, as it speaks to your First Amendment right, really specific to libraries, um, we learn more and more. And what we have learned is that in its essence, the court of law has said that in order to have freedom of speech, so again, our First Amendment right as written in the United States Constitution Bill of Rights, in order to have freedom of speech, you have to have freedom of thought. In order to have freedom of thought, you have to have freedom of freedom of informed thought. In order to have freedom of informed thought, you have to have freedom of information. And where do you get free information in this country is at your public library. So the case law that is the current precedent right now is Kramer versus Bureau of Police in the town of Morrison from 1992. And the court held in that uh, court decision that freedom of speech includes the right to receive information and likewise have held that libraries are the quintessential locus of the receipt of information, according to that third court of appeals, essentially ruling that access to a public library is a corollary First Amendment right. And that is how our public libraries are immediately tied now to your constitutional rights um, here in the United States. So that's a pretty lofty ask for libraries. And so there are some governing rules that public libraries have to follow. Um, so the first is that we are considered a, a limited public forum. What that means is that there are three different types of public forums. Um, the first is the traditional public forum, which is what um, existed when our founding fathers created the constitution. It's it's the public square. And it's what we now these days really refer to like our public parks. Um, the reason why we're allowed to petition and do rallies in our public spaces is, is really held under that traditional public forum. Now, public libraries are considered a limited public forum. And what that means is that, yes, we are a government agency that is um, there to, with ties to our First Amendment, with our constitutional um, expectations, and that in order for us to uphold our constitutional requirements, there are things that we have to be able to do. And so in doing that, we can set certain restrictions, and those are called time, place, or manner restrictions. Essentially, it says that in order for us to protect your First Amendment rights, we have to be able to say we uh, put in some parameters around that. So some examples. A time restriction. So the public library is allowed to say um, we're open from this hour to this hour. And that is because in order to protect your First Amendment rights, we have to staff the library building. And library staff also have their own rights, including BOLI and um, other employment law. And so we can't leave, keep the building open 24 seven in order to fully staff the library in order to protect your first amendment rights. So we're allowed to put in a time restriction. You're allowed to put in a place restriction. So something along the lines of in order for us to check materials in and out and get the items back out to the shelves, we have areas of the building that is staff only. And the reason for that is if the community was coming into the back and you know trying to browse the materials we're trying to shelf, it would impact the ability to get the materials out to the shelves to the general community and therefore having individuals in that space is an infringement on those First Amendment rights. So you're allowed to put a place restriction. People are not open to this, you know, the general public is not open to the staffing areas of the library. Um, and you can time, place, and manner. And the last, the manner restrictions are things like if this activity were to occur, it could infringe on the rights of the others using that space. So for example, you aren't likely allowed to blast a boom box in the reference section because in doing that, you would infringe on the rights of others trying to do research and learn and read in that same space. 
What a public library can't do is content restrictions. Um, any restriction a public library does on your First Amendment rights has to be a time, place, or manner restriction. It cannot be a content restriction. A content restriction would be considered um, an infringement on your right and something that could be um, reviewed under a court of law. So people often say, well, you know, freedom of speech is not absolute. Um, so what are the parameters around that freedom of speech? And there are laws that tell you what you can and cannot say. Um, the most important ones and the one on the table for today is what's called the Miller test. And the Miller test is, um, again, given to us through precedent during court cases, and it's the current law that defines obscenity. Um, so first off, something can't be determined obscene unless it has gone through the Miller test. And in order for it to have gone through the Miller test, it needs to have gone through a court proceeding. So any one individual saying that something is obscene is just, it's not true unless it has gone through a court of law determining that it is obscene. Now the test itself, again, the one that would be held to that standard if that item were put in front of a court to determine the Miller test is a three pronged test. And in order for something to be obscene, it has to fit all three elements of that obscenity clause. So it's not an or, it's an and. Those three clauses are whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would appeal to the prudent, salacious, or indecent interest um, taken as a whole. So as in, in essence, if the contemporary community standards, so you all, the community, would find that work as a whole to be considered indecent. Part two of the Miller test. So in addition to part one, part two, would be whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual content specifically defined by the applicable state law. So is the item uh, uh, patently offensive in sexual content based off of Oregon state law? That's part two. In addition, part three, in order for something to be considered obscene is whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So if one and two are true, does this work have any literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? If it does, it is not considered obscene under a court of law. So that's the Miller test, which is likely on the table today to be reviewed by the board. There are other areas that do um, have restriction under First Amendment that are maybe not as applicable today. Um, the first is whether or not it's child pornography. Um, that also has a definition by law. The ultimate definition is that it depicts a minor, um, an actual minor, so not a photo, a, a, not a um, illustration or a passage in a book. It's not a drawing. It's an actual visual depiction of a minor um, involved in a sexually explicit act. Other uh, governing laws around First Amendment are defamation and slander. Um, there's also fighting words, which is the one that individuals mo most often turn to. That's the one where you can't say fire in a crowded movie theater. And the reason behind that is it would incite immediate um, imminent lawless action. So in, in calling out fire in a crowded movie theater, um, it, you could potentially hurt somebody. Somebody could get trampled in that act. And that is why that is illegal. Um, and then the last is that national security via the Patriot Act. Essentially, the government can um, restrict access on anything if they consider it national security. So the last part that I think is on the table today is a term called in loco parentis. And that is the governance around public libraries as far as their role um, when it comes to access to materials for minors. 
Ultimately, the role of librarians is to advise and assist users in selecting information. But for our minor users, parents and only parents have the right and responsibility to restrict their own children's access and only their own children's access. For a librarian to restrict the access of information for a child that is not their own would be a question of infringement of those rights of that user. So um, it is really held entirely under the parent to decide what is um, responsible for their children. And it's only um, applied to that one parental unit. It isn't applied to the community as a whole. The last thing I want to touch on very quickly, because I know you have more information to cover today, is, is we are really talking about censorship. So yes, there's a term out there, a very popular term called book banning, which ultimately the, the popular definition on that is that the item is removed from the library. Um, but your First Amendment rights is more about censorship than it is about specifically book banning. The definition of censorship is the suppression of access to information based off of one person's objections. And you can suppress that access in a lot of different ways. And it's not just the removal of the book from the library. All of these elements would be considered censorship under that First Amendment access to information. So the first would be restriction. So if that item was available to the public and has now been restricted in some way, um, say behind a reference desk or requiring a permission slip, that would be considered censorship. You have suppressed the access to that content that was previously available. The next is redaction. So saying, you know, I'm not going to remove the materials, but I'm just going to remove this one section. So I'll just redact it. Um, again, you had access to that work as a whole prior to that redaction, and that would be considered suppression of that access and would can be considered censorship. Relocation. So saying, I'm not going to remove this material, but I'm going to just put it in the adult section or put it somewhere else. Um, materials are cataloged and placed in libraries based off of their intended audience. So in order to, if you were to move that book from its intended audience, the intended audience would have lost the access to the content that they normally would have, and it would be considered censorship. Uh, to relabel it, so to put some sort of content warning on the material, um, oftentimes those content warnings are considered restriction because they are telling the user, there's something nefarious about that book. There's a reason why you shouldn't check it out. If you are encouraging somebody to not access information, that is considered censorship. And then the last is removal. So that's the most common. That's what we can, you know, hear book banning. Um, but even if you weren't to remove it, but do any of these other elements, that those would still be uh, an infringement on the rights of your users. So I'm just going to wrap up. Um, I hope I have given you some helpful information. If you need any additional information, I want to point you towards our toolkit. This is the um, Intellectual Freedom Committee's toolkit available on um, through the Oregon Library Association. Lots of good resources there. And um, I am available. There's contact links on, on that toolkit. So any questions to the board specifically, if you have any questions for me. Okay, hearing none, I just wanna say thank you again so much for letting me um, talk today and give you some information. And I'll be here in the background if you need um, any questions as you go through your re review process. Thank you, Emily, Thanks. appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer and Emily. We will move to the first item under consideration. Thank you, Tess. Um, okay, so using best standards and practices uh, for the process of reconsideration of materials, um, all members of the review committee, the board members of the review committee, will have set aside their personal beliefs and evaluate the materials based on the standards outlined in the library's collection development policy. Um, so. 
to you officially as the liaison, you don't get to vote for that. Um, so, yes, so the board, as we have today, we have four members of the board today. Um, if we end up with a tie, I think I become the tiebreaker. Um, so as the library board it is written in our policy that the board will consider whether the material meets the criteria of the selection policies described herein. And again, those are available on our website. I'm not going to read them in entirety, but using those guidelines and along with um, what we've just heard from Emily about uh, the First Amendment. So please do consider the uh, material as whole. Um, passages or parts of the work in question should not be pulled out of context. Uh, please consider the materials relevance to the library's mission and the collection development policy. Also ask, is this item, is this item suitable for the intended audience? Uh, does this item reflect accuracy, authority, and literary or artistic merit? Uh, does this item reflect community interests? Um, and are there reviews and recommendations uh, from reputable resources, sources? So I, I do have some backup information here if you would like additional information. Or do you have any questions about um, those guidelines? Thank you. Um, so uh, again, for the first item for review, we have um, Entango makes three. I received two uh, letters requesting the removal of um, this item. The author is Justin Richardson, along with Peter Parnell. Um, so as you've all received those requests for reconsideration previously, do you have any questions about the content of those forms? And do you feel that they were filled out completely so that you're under, able to understand uh, the concerns? No questions. Thank you. Um, all right. And I do also want to ask, have you all had an opportunity to read um, Entangle Makes Three in its entirety? Yes. Right, thank you. Um, so based on the criteria that we've outlined, I want you to please take a moment. Um, Tess has handed out the material reconsideration form. Um, and so only the, the recommendations, the supporting documents that you said that um, that you said you have the information there, you have on both of them. I'm sorry, so the reconsideration. You said one of your policies, one of the criteria was to have backup material that would stand to it. Correct, right. yeah, so I. Because um, I didn't read that. I didn't pull those, I didn't share all of that out. Um, there, we, we do have a list of all of the various um, uh, awards, awards that the books have received and also um, reviews from from reputable sources. So it, um, if you have a question about those, I can refer to those if you'd like. So what we'll do is, um, if you had an opportunity to um, to fill that out, we'll just collect those. Um, and again, according to our policy, the board does make this vote as to whether or not the material fits in the collection, makes that recommendation to me as the library director, uh, and then we move forward from there. Okay, for and Tango Mike 3, the board has uh, made a decision to keep the material in the Seaside Public Library. And we move on to the second item under consideration. Thank you, Tess. Thank you, Board. Uh, we have the title, When Aiden Became a Brother. This is by Kyle Lukoff. And I'll ask you those same questions, um, you know, based on um, based on our, our policies, based on, you know, have, have you had an opportunity to, to read the item in its entirety? Um, you, you have received the request for reconsideration. 
uh, and and have heard the complaints, uh, the the concerns of the of the individuals. Um, do you have any questions about either the the content of that form of those two forms, or um, if, do you have any questions about uh, the book itself and its pertinence to our collection? No. No. You would then pull out the official forms so that we can. I have a question. Do you have any assistive listening devices? I'm sorry, we do not. It's okay. I apologize. Board has voted to recommend that when Aiden became a brother, uh, should be retained in the Seaside Public Library. Mm -hmm. well, um, thank you, Board, for your time today. Thank you also to the folks who have uh, taken the time to show up uh, and share their thoughts. Uh, it does look like the board has voted to retain both of these titles in our collection. Um, as per our policy, I will notify the individuals who submitted the request by mail with this official announcement. And I believe that uh, the city of Seaside will be um, putting out a, a, press a press release, sort of summarizing uh, what, what we did here today. So again, thank you to the board for your time. I appreciate it. Yes? Were the votes unanimous? I don't believe I need to share that, but thank you for asking. Your response. Mm -hmm. Meeting is adjourned.